brains uh, actually work on fairly simple principles. And you may have heard otherwise. You may have heard that you know, the brains of the most complex machines in the world will never understand how they work for the next thousand years or so. But that's just not true. And over the last five or six years, a lot of progress has been made on understanding how parts of the brain work. Um, and it's fairly simple. We can build machines that work on these principles, and uh, those machines are going to be very, very beneficial. From a computer scientist's point of view, the part of the brain that's most interesting is the neocortex. If you were to open up my head right now, the neocortex is the big wrinkly thing that covers the rest of the brain. It's the most interesting thing because, in, by the way, in a, in a human, it's about 60% of the volume of the brain. Uh, in a human, it's, uh, it basically is the location of all high-level knowledge that we're interested in. All high-level vision occurs in the neocortex, all visual knowledge. All language is in the neocortex. All high-level somatosensory and motor. All, my language, is, my speech is coming from my neocortex right now. Anything you can tell me verbally is stored in your neocortex, plus a lot of things you can't. It's a flat sheet of cells, and if you ironed it out, it would look like this dinner napkin. It's about this size, about 1,000 square centimeters and 2 to 3 millimeters thick. Now, what do we know about the structure of this organ? Well, we know that there's different areas of the neocortical sheet, this thin sheet of cells, that do different things. They're different regions. So there's regions that are involved in vision, in language, in motor control, in playing Parcheesi, and so on. There's all these different regions that they've mapped out. The little boxes in there, the little blue boxes, are regions of the monkey's neocortex. The lines represent how they're connected together. And so when you see a line, it's, it's a bundle of fibers going one way and the other way. On the left side of this diagram is the somatosensory motor part of the brain, that is the touch and motor, and on the right side is the visual part. At the bottom of the picture are the sensory organs, so on the left the skin, on the right the retina. And information flows from the retina into a set of these regions in the cortex, and it goes from region to region up and also flows back down. This is the structure that nature uses to store information about the world. Each region is similar. What I mean by that is they look very similar. If you look at any one of these regions in the neocortex, on any mammal species, it doesn't matter, rat or human, it's the same thing. The detailed anatomy in that region, the layers, the cell types, and how they're connected together, is nearly identical. They look nearly identical. And it was speculated in 1979 by Vernon Mountcastle that actually they're all doing the same thing that each region of the neocortex, regardless of what it's connected to, is doing the basic same operation. And what makes a visual region vision is because it's, in the, it's connected to the eyes in the visual hierarchy. And what makes an you know, auditory one is because it's connected to sound. This is an amazing discovery. It's all amazing that it took many years for neuroscientists actually to believe it could be true. But it is true, and it's one of the beautiful discoveries of nature, how it basically uses the same algorithm to solve all these problems. So it makes our job a lot easier. These uh, yellow regions are the primary regions that are associated with recognizing what visual objects look like. The neuroscientists call it the ventral pathway, the what pathway. So if I want to know where the knowledge about what cats and dogs look like, it's on these yellow regions. And we know that if you look at cells at the bottom of these, at the bottom regions here, close to the retina, they recognize simple things like lines and edges and corners. And when you get to the top, there's cells that represent very complex objects, complete objects anywhere in your visual field. A friend of mine, actually an alive human, they found cells that respond to Bill Clinton. So when this person sees Bill Clinton in any particular way, any orientation, whatever, that cell lights up. And if this person imagines seeing Bill Clinton, that cell lights up. I suppose it's probably a uh, Hillary Clinton cell. Maybe they're close to each other. Who knows? <laughs> this shows you that it's really like the bottom region is not like one region. It's like a lot of little regions. And it's more like a, it's more like a tree-shaped hierarchy. And this is how the connectivity shows us what it's like. This is all from biology. I'm not making this up. It's like a tree-shaped hierarchy. We have a lot of little regions at the bottom. They converge, converge, converge as you go up the hierarchy. And unlike this diagram, it doesn't show the information also flows back down. This is nature's data structure for knowledge about the world. This, this is the visual system, but the very similar hierarchies exist in the auditory and the somatosensory space. This is it. This is the, basically, things like this are narrower, wider, and so on, but they're basically all like this. That's how knowledge is stored in your brain. And we want to ask the question, can we understand how this structure works? Because if we understand how it works, then we can build machines that work like it. And the answer is you can. And we have. We figured it out pretty much. Uh, we have the basics of how this works. And I'll just tell it to you. It's not that hard to understand. It's actually, I promise, it's pretty simple. Uh, now, we already said that all nodes do the same thing. That's a given pre premise that comes from the neuroscience. They all do the same thing. What is it they're doing? Whether, you know, these are just cells. They're looking at patterns. They don't actually know what the patterns mean. They don't know if it's vision or anything else. They're just patterns. It's all the same. What they do is they do two basic operations, any node in this hierarchy. They look for common spatial patterns, things that occur at the same time, and then they look for sequences of those, things that are typically common follow-on at a time. You can think of it like a melody. 
A common temporal sequence would be, I hear a series of notes or intervals over and over again, I say, oh, I recognize that, that's a melody. I'm gonna remember it, I'm gonna remember that sequence. And what I do as a node in this hierarchy is I pass the name of the sequence, the name of the melody to my parent. I don't give them the details, I don't say here are the notes, I say here's the name of the melody I recognize. And what happens is the parent's now doing that too, because it's all doing the same thing, and the parent learns a sequences of sequences. And you end up with a hierarchy of sequences of sequences of sequences. And one of the consequences is if you have a very fast changing pattern at the bottom, like my speech right now, going on your cochlea and your ears, creates this very fast changing, changing pattern on the bottom of your auditory hierarchy in your brain. As it goes up the, up the hierarchy, it slows down. It's basically learning, oh, I recognize this piece, this piece, this piece. And then you have slower changes at the top and faster changes at the bottom. If you can put a pattern at the bottom that's very noisy or occluded or missing stuff, and you have a very, a very one pass through the system, you have a very clear percept of what's going on at the top. Your perception of the world is very clean. If you actually could see the data coming on your senses, it's messy, it's awful. And when, when and people, researchers start looking at this, they can't believe it works. It's because you have this belief propagation network, and by the time you get to the top, it just cleans it all up. It's like, what's the most common belief here that makes sense? Um, a friend of mine, a guy who was working at my institute, a graduate student named Dilip Joy, he, he did this work three years ago. So some of you may have seen this before. I apologize. I'll show you some new stuff if you haven't seen this. But three years ago, he says, can we build this stuff? And he said, let's try. And so he started off with a very simple vision system. He built a three-level hierarchy that looked at a 32 by 32 pixel patch. And, and then he, and so at the bottom of this hierarchy, there's 64 nodes, each looking at four by four pixels and so on. It's a very simple visual system. He trained it on a series of line drawings. These are the 48 characters he, he used. These, and when he trains these, you just take these little pictures and we make movies of them. I'm not gonna show you that, but we make a movie of them and we move it in sort of in front of the retina of this little memory. And it learns sequences of sequences and sequences and it learns to recognize these things. So we can come back later and we can now show it novel patterns it's never seen before. These are all um, uh, uh, patterns that are just you know, noisy, messed up versions of things that it, it was trained on. So on the left you see, there's a, the col each column is a different uh, category. So we have dogs on the left, you can see the dogs are recognized facing left and right with a lot of noise and distortion and so on. These are very novel patterns, it hasn't seen these. Um, it's very hard to trip it up. And, and one th you can like morph between two images and just when you make one, it really messed up images and just like you say, I think this is starting to look like another character, it'll do the same thing. Here is a picture of the little helicopter. You probably can't see it. One of our characters, it's at the bottom of this picture. It's hidden in a field of noise. And I would put this into our system. It doesn't do, it does pretty good actually. You get about 20% recognition rate. Even though there's a lot of noise in there, it's kind of hidden. But it's not anywhere near 100% which it should be. We now can show the exact same thing, but we're going to show it a little movie. We're going to show that little image moving through the field of noise, and it'll pop out for you. You'll see it. So watch. It's a little movie here, and you'll see the helicopter move to the left at the bottom, and then it go across and move across the top, and it sort of pops out for you when, you, when it moves like that. Um, same thing happens for the HTM. It pops out. It does much, much better recognizing that. It says, oh, I got it. I can see it. It just jumps out, just like it does for you. I can even show the same thing where the noise is dynamic. So I'm going to show the exact same movie, but the noise is changing. In this case, pretty much every pixel is changing uh, in every frame of this image. And you'll see, but the helicopter still can pop out, and it does for you, and it does for the HTM. And although the recognition isn't quite as good, it's still much, much better than if you didn't have the noise. So we took this, this, we basically did a lot of testing, doing attentional stuff and all kinds of stuff, just to make sure we could really build this stuff. But what do we do with it now? What to do? So this is several years ago. And I said, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write a book about this. Um, so, and I did. I wrote a book called On Intelligence. It was published uh, three and a half years ago. Uh, the second thing we did is I said, look, I want to accelerate interest in this, in this field. I want to get more people working on this. I want to, uh, I want to get more you know, smart people coming on board. And it's, there's a lot to be done. So I said, let's turn it into a technology ourselves. So I was running a nonprofit institute at the time. I moved it lock, stock, and barrel to Berkeley because uh, there was a bunch of scientists who were employed there. Um, we then formed a company called Numenta. Uh, and we basically are creating a platform for experimenting with these software, these tools. Uh, and we're, our goal is to build a community of developers, getting a lot of people working on this, uh, getting, you know, because th there's many, many things that need to be done. Uh, I just, I'm not trying to publish, so you can download the software, you can play with it, it's free for research. And you might want to run on anything from a single core CPU on a laptop, which it'll run fine. You can run on a multi-core CPU, we can use all those cores because it's all parallel processing. And you can run on a big cluster computer, which is what we do most of our development on. The applications are all over the map. I'm just going to give you some flavor from, we've been surprised at a number of people in the gaming industry um, who want to use it. Um, other people doing sort of visual editors and so on. There's a, we're working with a major car company who's trying to use it to basically understand traffic. We're doing a bunch of things with voice. Uh, 
a bunch of people doing vision type applications of various types. Um, process control. It turns out you can take manufacturing data and you can feed it into this stuff and it kind of discovers what the cause is and you can do inference and figure out what's going on in there. Uh, people are trying to use it in financial markets and so on. Uh, at Numenta, we have decided to do a very high-end, a, a real good vision system as our test case. This is to test out the tools, to test out the algorithms. So we've gone from those little line drawings. We're now doing uh, sort of high-resolution uh, black and white images. Color is actually pretty easy, but we're not. We, we don't want to get. We want to do the harder problem, which is black and white. And then you can, after the system's been trained, you can give it novel patterns. You clip them off the web. Um, and this is like, these are patterns it wasn't trained on. We say, here, what's this? And these are showing examples of images that got correct. It's these, I know all those are boats, I know those are cars, I know those are binoculars. Totally novel patterns. Once you've trained the system and it's discovered those causes, which is valuable in its own right, you can do inference. Inference is just pattern recognition. You can do spatial and temporal pattern uh, inference, or pattern recognition. The system can make, then can do predictions. And um, prediction, believe it or not, is just the flip side of behavior. The way you generate behavior is exactly, the way the brain does it is, is exactly the way it does predictions. It's, it's essentially that pattern flowing down the hierarchy. And of course, it can work on any kind of input. You can do like vision, auditory, tactile, human type of stuff, but it works on many non-biological problems as well. well HTMs, hierarchical temporal memories, are very efficient. And the reason is, is because of the hierarchy. Things lower down in the hierarchy are reused at the next level up, and those are reused at the next level up. So if I've spent a lot of time learning what certain animals look like, and, and then I'm exposed to a new animal, it's likely going to have fur or skin or scales or feet or eyes and so on. I don't have to learn all that stuff again. When you first start training, it takes a long time to get the first few layers trained, but then it gets much, much faster. It's just like a human. You spend many years basically look like you're not learning anything. Um, there's a little baby, but you're actually forming the foundation of this hierarchy, and then the learning gets very rapid after that, and that's the way these systems work. And these systems are self-learning. You don't get to choose. You don't get to pick, this is the knowledge I'm going to extract from the world. It extracts it on its own. And, um, and that's a good thing, because we know how to do that. Uh, when people first design a new technology, they can never really predict where it's going to go. You know, when they invented the first computers, they couldn't anticipate the internet, they couldn't anticipate satellites and GPS and cell phones and so on. They just couldn't. There's no way. And when, if, if HMs are as big a deal as I think they're going to be, we cannot predict where they're going to go either. Um, the first thing people always do is apply to the obvious problems like computer vision or um, you know, language recognition and so on. We're, we're, we're going to do all that stuff. But the interesting stuff, the really cool stuff is going to occur later. And I can say there's no reason at all we can't make you know, uh, silicon-based HTMs a million times faster than biological ones. Neurons are slow. Well, that has a lot of advantages. It means I can solve problems I couldn't solve otherwise. I can apply to real-time data like humans couldn't possibly look at. I might even want to slow it down. It gives us that flexibility. The second thing is we can experiment with architecture. Uh, you know, mammals have only been around for a while, you know, you know a fair long time, but as in the history of all animals, not that long. And nature has experimented with several you know, varieties of these hierarchies and keeps discovering the bigger it makes them, the better it is. Um, we can do a lot of experimentation. We can, tr we can change the, the size of the hierarchies. We can make memories that are much, much bigger than human memories. We can apply them in different ways. We can experiment with different learning algorithms, algorithms and so on. We can do a much, much faster job, but nature has a fairly slow process of doing. So we can experiment. With, no doubt we can make these things do things that brains don't do very well. And the third thing is, and the th thing is probably the most exciting for me, is that you can interface HTMs to, to, to foreign senses, like non-biological senses. We don't have to be restricted to eyes, ears, and skin. Uh, we can do infrared. We can do, um, uh, we can, we can, as I mentioned earlier, we can feed in financial data. We can feed in, you know, sensors from cars and laser scanners and things like that. Um, there's a huge series of opportunities of, of, of modeling data, data discovery, and causal discovery on data that humans don't interface with well. And if, if a human wants to understand any of that stuff, we have to translate it into some other pattern, like visual patterns a human can relate to, but we can feed it directly into the HDM. So I think it's a, a very, very exciting uh, technology, and uh, it's got a lot, of, a lot of future to it. I believe it's going to really represent the second generation of, of computing, and, uh, and it, it, it's, that, it's that profound. Um, I, one thing I want to point out is that if, it's, don't worry about this stuff. This is not like robots taking over the world. Uh, well, there's a few laughter here, but you know, I get this all the time. Like, aren't these machines going to be, you know, resentful? Um, and you know, first of all, they, they don't replicate. They don't have emotions. It's just a box doing inference. Okay, I'm, I'm hoping to find one or two people, maybe five, in an audience like this, who say, "Damn, that's cool. I want to work on that." Uh, and you can. There's a tremendous opportunity here. Uh, it's like a whole new ball game here. 
Uh, you can easily do that. You can read my book. You can go to our website, download the stuff. You can play with the tools. 